Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, president and editor-in-chief of DevX. This week, we'll be breaking down the big headlines in global development and bringing in some top experts to help us do it. If you want to follow along with the stories we're talking about, check out devx.com and subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Newswire. There's a link in the description. Follow us along on Twitter, and you can see many of the stories we're talking about today. And we'd love to hear what you think. This is This Week in Global Development. I'm joined by a regular on the show, Nasser Ismail. Hi, Nasser. Hi, Raj. Thanks for having me again. For everybody who hasn't heard you before, uh, they should know that you've had senior roles at uh, Giving Tuesday and at CoImpact. You directed the Somalia NGO Consortium. You've had lots of roles in international NGOs, including as country director in Somalia for Oxfam International and, and many other hats you've worn over your long career in humanitarian and development work. So it's great, great to have you back with us and especially great to have you because I want to talk about, of course, the news of the week that we cover here at DevX. Mm-hmm. But I also want to talk about this uh, exciting, at least for our community, exciting new docu-series that HBO has put out called Savior Complex. And, uh, and maybe we can start there because it, it tells the story that I think is probably known to many people in our audience, but maybe not all, um, about a Christian missionary nonprofit that was set up uh, in the mid 2000s in Uganda and that, you know, went on to serve malnourished children and then become a pretty significant source of controversy itself for uh, the way it was treating those children and the way it presented its own capabilities, and particularly its founder and leader, a woman named Renee Bach, an American who was out there. And, uh, and then became the, the source of massive controversy and an organization called uh, No White Saviors, kind of an online activist group that went after it. Um, and so that, that subject is the story of, um, or that story is the subject of this HBO miniseries, which I haven't finished watching entirely. I've watched almost all of it, but I, I'd love to get your take on it, Nasser, because you've you know, been so close to these issues, given your personal background, your work, and uh, you know, I don't know if you had a chance to see it yet yourself, but I know you know the, the story yeah. it tells. Yeah, yeah, no, I, um, I I think it's important to start with that one. I think uh, just for anybody who loves documentaries and who is really trying to educate themselves in a sector that I think often, for those of us in global development, I mean, we get a particular harsh um, media attention in terms of what our work is all about in the nonprofit sector, what we're doing when um, scandals happen, and ultimately who tells our story and how. And so I think actually it's a great, it's very sad. It's so tragic. It's so um, depressing. I don't, I don't, I'm not surprised you haven't finished watching all of it. It's three episodes, I think about an hour long, but, but I'm glad actually there's some controversy around, you know, whether HBO should have cleared this, should have made this, producer should have greenlit this. But as somebody who's been in the sector for uh, nearly 20 years, I'm glad it was made. Um, there's really no justice at towards the end, but with Rachel, I, here's, here's what I thought and here's why I so wanted to have this discussion in our platform here. Um, it, it is, it, this girl Renee was so young by the time, and I'm, you know, quoting her. She heard God's, um, voice in her head to go to Uganda, to go to Africa and save children. For missionary organizations, I'm sure this is not all of the, a way they describe their work, but there's something truthful about her, um, you know, uh, confidence in herself enough to go to this trip in a place she has no uh, studies and professional training or even uh, pre- previous um, trips to substantiate what she thinks she can do and what she thinks Uganda has uh, on, on offer for her. But she didn't just go. She set up a whole institution. She became the executive director of that institution. Mind you, no single, no training, no, just a homeschooling education. I don't think she ever went to university and or even medical training, which is the bigger part of the story here. And then under her tutelage, under her, um, uh, her, her, her quote unquote leadership, she ended up committing some horrific crimes, which she has not been taken to court for both in um, Uganda or even in the U.S., and a, n- a great number, almost 106 children, died under, quote unquote, her care. And when I heard people talk about, you know, well, were there doctors? Were there people? There were. And I hope people tune in for those conversations and the pieces and the stories of other people, Ugandan doctors, Ugandan lawyers, who all of them were shocked and took her to task. And she still, you know, got away from being held accountable. 
And the stories are shocking. The descriptions are shocking. What she tried with children and medical malpractice, essentially, without having any medical background, is unexcusable. But it is, it is a great teaching, despite how horrific the nature of her work is. Yeah, I think the documentary, at least what I've seen so far, does a really good job in telling everyone's side of the story, right? It, it doesn't seem to come down and mm -hmm. sort of say, here she is, a, a, this horrible murderer. They have people who say that. But they also show her side of it right. and at least her sense of, you know, intentions, which, you know, she says were really good and she was trying to help kids and she was trying to do the right thing. And these were very sick children in a, in a part of Uganda that didn't have a very strong primary health care system and overwhelmed, mm -hmm. you know, hospital, as, as is often the case in, in many low income countries. So it kind of tries to present her side of it fairly, I thought, and what I've seen so far. But then, of course, you get the the other side, which is, well, you know, if she's not a trained medical professional, why is she dressed like one? Why does she have a stethoscope? Why is she engaging in medical procedures? Um, sometimes when maybe no one else was around, but then even when they were right. trained and, and paid doctors and nurses from her organization right there at the bedside, and why is she doing these things? And so there, there's some quite damning testimony yeah. from the other side of the, and I think especially those videos of someone with no training or qualifications, oh, yeah. doing medical work on, on children who are clearly, you know, severely malnourished. You know, it, it's, a, again, it's a tragedy yeah. about what happened there, but it also is kind of a, a tragedy about the larger story, right? About the fact that at this point, we still don't have strong enough primary healthcare systems in so many right. parts of the world where there's an even, there is even such a need that, any young person could just come in and say, I'm going to start a clinic and, and end up trying to fill that gap. Exactly. And, and the gap is still so big that, you know, the, they talk to the rural hospital director who says, yeah, I actually kind of needed her help because, you know, we were overwhelmed. So sure, we would send some people there, some kids that we had to discharge to say, you know, keep feeding them. Um, you know, they're getting better. They're on the mend, but we need some support. So just the fact that the needs are so great that you would rely on essentially a kid to support them yeah. is a you know it's a it's a i don't know commentary i guess on on the lack of investment and the lack of success that we've had as a global health and development community in building up these these systems absolutely absolutely i think where there were uh trained uh staff nurses doctors i mean she she had a lot of ugandan uh trained um personnel around her uh, one of the scenes that will probably never leave me, and I think I, I will start as I do a lot of uh, global conversations around philanthropy about power and what power means in a sector where we're not talking about just capacity issues, but it's power that's really tied to perception and bias. But there was a Uganda doctor attending to alongside her um, to one of the health clinics that she was um, that they were supporting under their uh, mission organization, which was called uh, Serving His Children. And um, the doctor at some point in one of those uh, episodes does say, like, I, I obviously am the doctor I'm attending. I have the power to oversee some of these issues. But he still, when he was asked, why did he intervene? Why didn't you uh, recognize that she obviously, and even to her credit, she says, I was not, a, I'm not a trained doctor. I don't know what I'm doing here. And he said, you know, she's still my boss. So, so just to see, you know, where is accountability, not just with her, but even with the with, with those who are Ugandan, who are of the country, to say you played a part as well. Yes, there's decolonization mindsets that have to be uh, lifted and have to be worked on, but still that you had the credentials and that you this was your community and your, um, your, your arena for expertise. And there's a 20-something-year-old uh, untrained um, volunteer whose uh, presence and whose power overwhelmed you to to not intervene there's so many questions i think rogers you pointed out this asks of us moral legal questions responsibility power um, and ultimately the underlying foundational issue um, how do we support um, health systems recover how do we support health systems to be in tip-top shape so everyone is able to get the best quality care and that is a government you know responsibility at least with respect to uganda but i this this brought so many questions to me and i really hope people talk about it uh, and, and, and engage with it. Yeah, I think one of the, the interesting approaches that the documentarians took, which I thought was really effective, is the beginning of the documentary starts with hearing from, 
you know, the, the Americans, the white people, they're talking, they're sharing their, their take. Renee uh, is, is featured prominently. And then they have video of, you know, children and mothers, um, but you're mm-hmm. hearing them speak in their language and it's not translated. But only a bit later, they actually go back and, and translate. And you can, it's, instead of just being these, you know, voiceless figures in the background, you actually start hearing from the mothers, from the children, you start hearing from the medical professionals a little bit later on. And so it really rounds out the story and, and it, it gets exactly to the point that you're making us right? like that from their perspective, they were seeing a white woman dressed as a doctor with a stethoscope. So the moms and the kids figured like, Hey, this is, this is good, right? This is somebody coming to provide food and medical care. And then the, the trained medical professionals who know otherwise, some of them said, well, I thought she was trained. I assume she was trained. And then others say, yeah, I knew she wasn't, but she's, she was my boss, you know, and, and she had all the power and jobs are scarce here in Uganda. And, and when you get one, you don't want to lose it. So, you know, I, th- I thought that was a very effective approach and it kind of speaks to a broader challenge we have in the global development community, which is to say, give voice to those who are closer to the work who have lived experience, who are the people from the communities where the, the challenges and the issues are trying to be addressed. And, and we still here, even in 2023, I think do that very poorly and very rarely that we, you know, we still often center in the stories, the Americans and the Europeans, the, you know, the big global organizations, and we often lose the voice of the people who really, you know, know what's happening, who are closer to it. And that's where all of the all the valuable information really is housed, you know, in terms of what's working, what's not, and why it's not. And, and one of the things that um, that uh, just reminds me of, which is a big takeaway for me, is because of those dialogues, because of how well I think at least the documentary um, filmmakers did to ensure that there were many perspectives here and, and complex decision making. So when someone on in, in, in Uganda in this health clinic says, I know there's something wrong. There are power um, issues layered throughout the system, but I also have to feed my children. I have to keep this job. It, it really, for me, centers the complexity of our work and the fact that sometimes when we think about scandals, it's not a yes or no, it's not a black and white, it's not so simple. It's deeply complex layered issues of people trying to take care of their, their, their family first and foremost, but also knowing that there are some deep accountability gaps here. And I know this came up quite a bit in terms of accountability in the nonprofit sector and scandals and what happens. But, you know, um, she, she, this young girl, Rachel, also raised a whole hell of a lot of money. So there are so many things that substantiated her power to do right and wrong. Um, but, but again, I hope the story continues to um, touch everybody who is in our sector. And I hope if, it, if, if anything, it teaches us the many perspectives to an issue, the fact that it's not black and white, it's not, you know, uh, one, one story against another. It's complex decision making with high risk. Now, sir, maybe think about a, a number of other kind of related issues in development. I'd love to get your take on it. You know, first of all, I thought of orphanages and the long history of especially Christian groups, but others, you know, raising money in places like Australia, in places like Europe and here in the U.S., of course, raising money by telling the story of, hey, there's lots of kids who are orphans and and they need to be cared for and and we're here to do that. And so those good intentions, that kind of uh, very distant view of of Africa or other poor parts of the world saying, oh, look, you know, there there are poor people over there and um, we don't really hear of their voices or as to why these orphans exist in such large numbers, but we just assume that's true. And then again, well-intentioned people going to church, writing checks, providing money in a collection plate. And in the end, what that has led to, that we, we now know, uh, is just a huge economy around orphanages, where a very large percentage of orphanages in, in some countries, of course, many countries have now started shutting them down, like Rwanda, but in places like Cambodia, there's been a lot of reporting on large numbers of orphans who aren't really orphans. They have a living parent, sometimes both, but there there's an economy around orphanages. There's money to fund them and a poor family might say i'd rather my kid goes there and gets fed but what are we doing to that child right and so there's been a big counter movement now in the last decade or so to really try to shut down a lot of these orphanages and to stop that economy and i think this documentary points a bit to the same story and makes me think of you know places like haiti maybe even places like somalia where you have so much experience nasra but where there's a very large humanitarian 
and development presence. It's very large in part because it's needed. There are real needs. But on the other hand, you wonder and you question, are we, are we creating this vicious cycle where the, the mere presence of so many well-intentioned people is creating an economy that's keeping the situation as it is and stopping true development, true you know, government provided systemic support for health and education. I wonder how you think about that and, and maybe maybe think about the context of Somalia since you know it so well and, and whether that fits fits here, Nasra. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um I you know, especially I think the political economy um side of things uh, works and we've got many examples on both sides with Rachel and her organization here, a five oh one C three organization here in the US and, and, and what they're uh, able to do both to raise funding, which is a great thing, but also um, with quote unquote well intentions, look how much harm they can do. And on the other side, it's not to say that there aren't organizations that are more native to a, a country in the global south where this also doesn't happen. Um, I spent um, five years working in East Africa. I spent two, two, almost three years of those, Raj, as you know, um, living inside um, the compound in Mogadishu. And when I when I went with, you know, having worked in U.S. government, having been a donor for quite some time, for almost eight years, when I went into the humanitarian sector, I had a lot of old biases. And I thought, you know, what is it about UN, ent UN entities, uh, Global North, um, you know, government entities, um, philanthropists from outside the region? What is it about them that we always think, you know, what, that they have really good intentions? They want to help. Um, and, and, and what is it? that happens and what's the story what's the complexity in terms of when money disappears when there are scandals when there's harm done when there are safeguarding issues i struggled with that for a very long time and i think after living there knowing the part, part parties looking at, at government systems uh, critiquing the international and the local system of delivery i could only come away with one thing which is um, we all have a stake in creating the kind of system where we want to deliver impact, to deliver great programs to the communities that we want to help. And it's never a one party um, story when it comes to corruption. It's actually very communal. Uh, there are networks, just like there are big networks in, in, in the global north and the global south, where there are human endeavors and there's poor structures. There will always be a network of um, people with good intentions, but who ultimately expose communities to a lot of corruption and ultimately a system. Um, it's really not about the who, it's about the how. And it almost always takes um, bad staffing, terrible organizational culture, um, terrible uh, leadership that does not look at the risks inside certain communities and does not uh, look at, you know, how are conflict ridden countries, how are co countries where 90% of services are being delivered by NGOs and there's no accountability from government, there's no strong systems from government. How do we, how do we tell the story of this, you know, uh, issue around corruption? And I feel like there's really no answer. And I stay away from thinking it's, it's one party, particularly here, I want to be clear, almost always the stories that I hear are pointing at local networks, local community leaders, bad guys on the local side. And had I not lived there, um, I would not know that there's so much more than, than meets the eye. And it's almost always a network of very, very high level elite uh, capture from Global North and Global South. And um, these are sensitive issues. I worked with a group of donors in Somalia where I had to say, oftentimes on behalf of a, uh, a global network of uh, NGOs who are doing 80% of the social services to Somalis, I had to say, we've lost money. And um, we have a way to report these things and, and here's who is involved and, and, and here's who is exposes. But ultimately, it was never just one international NGO or just one local NGO or just one donor. It was a combination of everything. It puts all of us who've been in this profession in a really terrible place, Raj. And I think, honestly, I just remember attending a couple of conferences, um, conversations with Rory and other political figures in UNGA to say, we just have to be a lot more interested in how we bring accountability to a very high standard and less about who's doing it. Because the who is never one who, it's many. Right. It's an entire system. And, you know, you're referring to Rory Stewart there, the former head of DFID who spoke on the DevEx stage during our UNGA summit. And I think you're also referring to the story we published a week ago, which really exposed the UN investigation into Somali aid and, and the tragic reality that 
an enormous percentage, 20, 30 percent or more uh, of that aid meant for people in desperate need was not going to them. It was being siphoned off and that the aid was being used for political purposes and being funneled to, um, you know, clans that were uh, had, had more power than others, et cetera. And I think, you know, in, in the wake of that reporting, the European Union decided to temporarily suspend their aid to Somalia. Uh, and it's a, it's a really challenging situation and, and challenging in many ways, like the documentary we were referring to, right, where the, the needs are real and they're great. And you, you don't want the people who suffer at the end of this to be the very poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable people, as we try to organize our systems to work better. But on the other hand, if you don't get those systems organized, uh, in the end, you never get out of this situation. Hi, I'm Kate Warren, Executive Editor at DevEx. If you are listening to this podcast, you are likely working to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. But are you subscribed to DevEx Newswire? Global development can be a fast-moving, complex sector. Our team of global reporters work every day to bring you the news you need to make sense of it all. In DevEx Newswire, we keep you up to date on issues ranging from climate change financing to gender equality and global health to transforming the food system, all in a fun-to-read, free newsletter delivered directly to you five days a week. Join the hundreds of thousands of global development professionals who receive DevEx Newswire and visit devex.com slash newsletters to sign up to this free newsletter today. Another story we published this week, um, Kelly Rogers uh, wrote a story for us about really what are the other ways USAID could fund besides the traditional kind of prime contractor, subcontractor approach in order to hit its localization targets. And, you know, that might sound like, well, it's very technical and how does it relate to this? But it's very similar in a, in a sense, because one of the reasons you end up with stories like what the documentary tells of this organization serving his children is that its founder, Rene Bach, had the access to money, had the ability to raise money in a way that a Ugandan local NGO simply couldn't. And so suddenly here's this young person with a budget of, you know, $150,000, $250,000. Um, that's really significant money where she was. And, and the question for local organizations, how do they get that? And you know, we, we had one, you know, actually the Ugandan organization in the story who's quoted um, and, and saying something about like having an annual budget that they were targeting of $50,000 and only being able to raise 3000. But what the story details is the idea that there are other modalities to try to get more money to these local groups, including networks. And, and also pooled funds. And I wonder what your take is on kind of the other modalities that are used, but maybe could be used more. No, sorry. Um, I've been around um, both of those conversations. I actually really love this article that's just trying to look at other avenues and being really, um, maybe let me say, between what we just talked about and, and this article, um, I find that um, when those of us who've been in the sector for a long time uh, who are trying to build better systems, um, scandal will, scandals will always happen. Um, you know, money uh, will always disappear. We're always trying to figure out how to protect communities from, you know, um, that becoming a norm, but also from systems from falling to a lot of innovation that happens in terms of, um, you know, how people want to not follow the rules, how organizations may be blind to so many things that are happening on all kinds of places around corruption. So I think ultimately, I, I we hope that we keep reporting on where good things are happening and where we are having some failure, ultimately, so we can build better systems. Um, I hope what it does it is it does not take attention away from improving government systems. I think in all my career, this is where I'm starting to see the big um, storyline here, which is uh, we are not in the in the business of just keeping nonprofits, private entities growing and growing and growing. Ultimately, this is a relationship that has to outlast all of us, and that is the relationship between citizens and their government. And so I really hope that we flip the coin um, when I tell you, like, for example, in Somalia, at least in the five years that I worked there, 80 percent of social services should not be delivered by those who are outside the country. They should be delivered by that 
government. And so whatever we have to do, we have to improve those systems. On um, networks, on funds, um, within philanthropy, um, I think the other day I was having conversations with some of my friends in New York just to say, I'm seeing so many Global South networks and organizations and entities saying, if we can just gain control of the funding, if we become donors, if we assert ourselves in a new way of working, then we've got to um, become funders ourselves. And so there's probably six or seven different funds by or at least being created by Global South entities. And I'm very happy for this because I think that's we have to innovate. You have to recognize that there are certain bilateral institutions that are not able to go beyond their procurement systems. Or if they do, it's going to take us quite a bit of time. So we need to look elsewhere. Pool funds aren't always perfect, but the UN has used them quite a bit. We used um, the pool funding um, to a great success in Somalia where we were able to work with UN OCHA to increase funding to local NGOs, the small ones, the ones who may be unregistered for some time, the ones who are in a place where we're not able to access for government, let alone local NGOs not even present. So we're able to do that for those conditions and places where we just didn't have a proper solution. And so I hope those continue. Um, on the other hand, within philanthropy, I was surprised, but I also really welcomed US, um, USAID and the leadership of Samantha Power partnering with philanthropy and saying your money is not tied to the same bureaucracy that the US citizens taxpayer dollars is. Won't you help us? Won't you create some avenue where we can use your funding in areas that the risk threshold is just too high for U.S. government systems. I thought that relationship and collaboration and announcement around democracy through locally led investment was really powerful. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, I think I was able to moderate a session during U.N. General Assembly uh, that was hosted at the Carnegie Corporation, um, all about networks. And I think networks are a really interesting approach that deserves a lot more attention uh, by USAID and probably by everyone else across the development space because you know if we focus so much on the on the contracting model uh, primes and subs etc I think what you end up with unfortunately is you know really high costs because you have to force those prime contractors to really focus on compliance that becomes the, the main driving force risk aversion and they're just doing what they're you know being told to do essentially. But I think if you could think of networks as a model where you get some of the benefits that you get with the traditional prime and subcontracting model, which is the international expertise, or not just necessarily north to south expertise, but expertise across countries that you get in an international NGO, uh, technical experts and people who can say, I've done this in this country, Here, here's how it could work there. Uh, you get the benefit of global systems, but maybe with much lower costs and much more money and authority going to the to the local organization because really it's a network of, of organizations from all over the world and ideally a network in which there's really equality among the members and so i think there's a chance for networks as we discussed in the session that i that i um, facilitated during the general assembly it just seems to me that there's a there's a chance for those networks to pick up and, and hold a bigger space in our discussion about how to better localized development work. Because um, in the end, and we talked about this a lot on the DevEx stage during UN General Assembly, in the end, it seems to me like there's more and more focus on how do we take the existing development dollars and make them go further. And a lot of that can't mm -hmm. just be checking the box as to who counts as local. Uh, you talked before about elite capture, and you can even have elite organizations that are quote unquote local and might just capture the funding and not actually achieve what we're all trying to achieve, it seems to me a lot more of what we need to focus on is results and different modalities that get you to results, right? And so um, networks could be a piece of that. And there's a, a really good, I think, explanation of what they are and how they work in the story we're talking about uh, here. It's entitled, How Should USAID Fund Differently to Hit Its Localization Targets? Um, so Nasser, as we kind of start to wrap up our, our conversation here, I, I'd love, you know, we, we've got into this from a specific story, which is, I think, really worth talking about because these specific stories and, and so well presented in the documentary it, it does highlight what some of the fundamental challenges are that we're trying to achieve even in things as technical as USAID localization uh, so I wonder if you could try to put a bow on all of that for us like what do you walk away having watched that and having knowing everything you know what do you walk away with in terms of what we ought to do differently here as a development community no I appreciate that and uh, I may not have a perfect answer but I think 
Um, you know, Raj, um, as soon as I saw this uh, um, documentary, I, I sent it to you. And I think um, other than just my respect for DevEx and, and how much I rely on the news uh, telling that you do and some getting to know your writers, you know, we're all part of a community. And so um, whether it's a network that helps us achieve some of our goals in new ways, um, I welcome that because at the very least, we're not just, you know, slamming our heads against the wall, trying to figure out how do we transform ourselves so we can transform the world that we so badly need to thrive in a planet that's got to be, you know, in a healthier place than, than we currently are. So I think that ongoing, deep, individual, but also societal uh, need to improve I think that's for me like where I see and I center this story about a really unfortunate case in Uganda and say, we need to talk about it. It's the ugly parts of the truth in our community, but we also have to point it towards a way to improve and say never again. We hope that these issues um, do not repeat themselves and we hope that we pay attention to the systemic issues of basic health rights to every living human being there is on earth. I think to me, one of the other things that it forces all of us to do, whether you're talking about localization or just, you know, fundamental reforms in our sectors, whether you're in DC or in Nairobi or in Beijing, is um, government systems are there to be dynamic. They're not meant to be, you know, tied to the culture, context, ecosystem from the time that they were created. USAID, just as, a, as an example, was created nearly 60 something years ago but it needs to show up in a way that's fit for the future and for the issues that we are all struggling with. So for me, the big lesson is we are dynamic. We are communities that are going to be asking each other tough things, and we are going to be looking towards a learning model that helps us um, not avoid the hard truth, but also uh, go and be inspired to change. Uh, I'll say like one of the other things that I really hope we get to talk about um, next time we talk is, you know, the White House just announced a few days ago that there's a fundamental major rewrite to the federal grant making rules, both for inclusive purposes here in the United States of America, but also for its work abroad. So I hope we just keep pointing to the future and, and ask ourselves, you know, how do we be better? That's that's what I'm leaving with. It's a question about myself and all those that I engage with. And it's one that I think invites so much curiosity and so much learning. Exactly. I mean, you want to have that transparency and that accountability from the start, not as in the tragic case of that documentary, you know, after it's all over. You, you want that to be early in the yeah. in the process and, and ongoing. Uh, and I, I'm reminded of uh, my friend Soji Adei, who, you know, was the director of health at the World Bank. You know, he's steeped in the development and health community, a, a senior leader in the space. But now, when, when he wrote a book fairly recently, and he, I've, I've had the chance to interview him about it, um, he essentially landed saying we need to get rid of what he calls neo-dependency in global health. And that by asking the very questions you eloquently you know, laid out, Nasra, we need to start to think about what is the system we want in the future. We can't just say, hey, we're here doing good things, so let's just keep doing good things because we will facilitate a kind of neo-dependency and it will end in tragedy and we won't get to the kind of development end goals that we're all you know, seeking. So I, I think these are pretty fundamental and existential questions and I think you, you laid it out brilliantly and, and it really does get to the mission of what we're trying to do every day at DevX. So thank you, Nasser, once again for joining this week in global development. It's been no, great to talk to you me. as always. Thanks. Great to be with all of you. Thanks again. See you soon. Take care, everybody. This has been This Week in Global Development. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe using the link in the description. To get even more coverage and analysis on the most pressing development issues of the day, become a DevX Pro member by going to devx.com membership and signing up. Thank you for listening and see you next week.